Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. It's a show about Gnosticism and philosophy and whatever I'm interested in this week that I can tie into Gnosticism. We've got Dr. Julie Resha here to talk to us about a bunch of really cheery things. Hi, Dr. Resha. How's it going? Hello. Good. Uh, really excited to, to speak to you today. Uh, we've been putting out a, a lot more content. Uh, I'm not quite sure when this episode's going to come out because I have a lot thanked, and I've decided just to put it all out. And, uh, you know, I, I'm quite sure that, that Gnosticism, which you don't need to know anything about, uh, I, I see similarities with some interpretations of it in, in your work, winds its way through all of uh, Western art, literature, philosophy, and thought. Not everybody agrees with me on that, but such is life. So people watching the show will be like, John, you know, I noticed last week, you know, your guest said that there's a, a secret wholeness to everything and that the actual point of existence and th the actual baseline of existence is a unity that is actually bliss. But this week, you're talking about something completely different. Well, folks, I don't really have any answers. It's a very complex world we live in, and I'm giving a lot of perspectives that I think tie into various interpretations of whatever the heck Gnosticism is. So with that uh, uh, intro, Dr. Resha, and I never intro the guests, I never give biographies, I never tell people how, you know, except saying how great their work is, but, you know, people will look you up after the show. They'll find your work. When your book comes out, they'll all buy it. Uh, you better, everybody listening and watching. Dr. Resha. Many people, they come to religion, psychology, psychoanalysis, looking to alleviate misery and to discover a, a lasting happiness. So I, I have an easy question for you, Dr. Russia. How do I find lasting happiness? Well, uh, considering that they're not able to find it, it's not actually an easy question. And um, I'm not sure that happiness is actually what we're looking for. And I'm not sure that is uh, something we want. And I'm not even sure that we actually want anything. So what I'm trying to develop is a different take on human being. Uh, the one that won't imply that all we want is happiness, all we want is to enjoy. And that this is what we're looking for. And even that we are uh, looking for anything is questionable for me. Mm. Um, I know it's it's hard to uh, because maybe because we got used to the perspective that we happiness is all we want. It's hard to switch uh, from this perspective, comprehend uh, ourselves uh, using a different way. But it is possible, especially when um, when you feel depressed, uh, which is considered depression or sadness, even are considered as a deviation, as something abnormal for human being, it's when we don't want happiness, we don't even want anything. But um, maybe it is actually when we coincide with who we are. So on the contrary, when we, uh, when we are not motivated, it's not that we are healthy. Uh, maybe what we are is, is unhealthy. So a bit mm. different, not a bit, but radically different negative perspective of comprehension of humans, just as an alternative to try it out. Yes, and uh, we'll talk about it at the end of the show, but uh, you know, you have an Aeon essay uh, about depressive realism. We'll send people to read it. But I'm wondering, can you tell us, uh, and you touched on it with, with the answer to the question that you just answered, but can you tell us more about depressive realism and uh, define it for us and uh, talk to us about Unpack It a bit? Yeah, depressive realism... Um is the concept that originated in psychology. Researchers Alloy and Abramson, they come up with the hypothesis that uh, when we're depressed, we are more in touch or just really sad. We are better in touch with reality, have more realistic worldview than when we happy and uh, not depressed. So it originated in psychology, but it's a very convenient concept to use um, in general, for some of the perspectives uh, in philosophy, precisely in existential philosophy, just to switch the perspective of, of more normal, conventional, positive uh, concentration, especially um, in psychology, which is almost entirely, except for this uh, depressive realism hypothesis, almost entirely positively oriented, which is, um, it uh, assumes that human being is in its healthy version, a normal version, 
and possible version is all happy, not depressed, and uh, depressive uh, state it would consider this positive per uh, perspective would consider as a deviation from uh, from normal state and as a depressogenic thinking would be considered as disorder as deviation of thinking as not a uh, good perception of of reality so the uh, it's close to philosophical pessimism like this take on uh, who we are and what are we for and even if there is a reason that we are uh, here so but for me, this Eon uh, essay got actually very popular. It's one of the most popular, surprisingly, because who would want to hear that uh, when we are depressed, we are actually coincide with who we are and most profoundly. But surprisingly, it is um, it's it become popular. But maybe it's because of the mistake. Uh, the editors asked me to add something positive, not positive, but like a conclusion. Uh, to give something to a reader. And the first line was um, uh, something that they added, I think, uh, as a conclusion was uh, be something that brings together depression and uh, becoming free. So you get freedom, and you get realistic world. So I come to think that it's still giving you something in exchange of this depression, it's still positive perspective, basically. Uh, you get realistic perception of you, you get something positive in exchange of, of your depression. So it is useful. It makes depression useful. It makes your vision realistic. Uh, it makes you a better person and it makes you free. So it's not actually um, depressive realism. It's very close. It's the most thing that is close the most to what I'm looking for, but it's still is still positive in the end and the question is even if we are able to articulate within our speech and through our thinking something that is truly negative maybe the thinking works in such a way that it renders everything negative that we get in touch every negative thought um, into positivity just to transfer it to someone or articulate it so the problem with the positivity is rather a problem with our thinking and the way speech works uh, then, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sure you know that's they included that uh, summation to to tie things up in a more positive bow. But but I also wonder if there's also you know I think the great evil of our age, the dominant philosophy, is is the philosophy of utility. Right, everything has to be useful in a way, and. Uh, Perhaps uh, would you say that, that these editors or some of the people who are approaching depressive realism are, are approaching it from this perspective, that if depression is inevitable, we can make it useful? Uh, we, we do make it useful, or at least we, we try to render it. For us, for something to exist, um, it's tautology, but it kind of has to exist. It has to have the positivity, right? It's supposed to be there it's supposed to give something it's supposed to be present and but there is some other for me i think there is this negativity that we escape through uh positivity from it but positivity is illusionary and negativity is actually what there is by not existing well it's um it's complicated but coming back to utility the idea i don't think that it's not I don't think that this is a problem of our age and there is a, some certain issue with people that there is something wrong with them and that they want to use something instead of, uh, I don't know, instead of something else. But if before there was other, um, those escape, positive escape mechanism from the negativity, from the absence, from the negative things, uh, it was salvation, for example, in Christianity. So it's, is it utility? Am I, <laughs> I'm going to be saved? Uh, or if I do something uh, after a good deed, uh, or I'm free myself from sin, is it utility? I don't think that there are wrong people who are trying to, um, you know, uh, make use of something that not supposed to be. Uh, maybe they are, but it's not just not my concern. <laughs> As terrible people or terrible ways of thinking and terrible trends. But the general way of our 
thinking that we practice or the quality the uh, the ways how thinking works and what thinking what is maybe uh more deeper than thinking or than another layer of thinking uh that we use thinking to escape from it so what thinking is escaping from because thinking is positive in itself it's not only uh, depression is sometimes connected to uh, thinking there is a hypothesis that uh, thinking is depressive uh, in itself it's supposed to be depressed because it's hard uh, to think various complicated things and uh, it kind of guarantee uh, depression guarantee our ability to uh, to think but it's still uh, thinking is always thinking in search for knowledge it brings knowledge it brings uh, or it constitutes knowledge it gives something or understanding my interest would be here I'm not sure if it's interest that not the the absence of ability rather to understand or non knowledge or non understanding that we're escaping from and we, we never reach complete understanding right so it's always um, the thinking basically fails but the very movement when it's trying to escape that that would be called thinking right does, does, does both thinking and language have a positive bias then. Yeah, I think so. I th not only that they have positive bias, but they are <laughs> they are positive biases. It's very hard to articulate using language and through thinking uh, negativity because they inherently uh, what defines them even is um, escape from from the dimension of negative, which is um, which is a dimension of death. We can say a dimension of void and. Um, once you include death uh, in the perspective because the positive orientation of sort of psychology of psychoanalysis even uh, with some exceptions but still uh, religion also with exception but um, the general framework is um, is quite positive it's the search for something uh, it's uh, you get something in return when you participate in in those and uh, the death, death disappears from uh, from here. It's uh, it's an attempt rather to overcome death or to we don't see it as uh, is as inevitable. That's our own death, but also of humanity and the larger endless scale of uh, universe, if you want. So, mm -hmm. how to articulate this? How to include the death? Because um, maybe thinking escapes from it, but uh, at the same time, it participates in it because it belongs to us and we are going to die. <laughs> yes, I, I want to come back to, to death in a moment, but um, you make me think, uh, when, when people talk about mystical experiences, right, um, which are usually positive, um, they, they talk about how it, it can't be put into language, right? You know, I became one of everything, you know, I approached the throne of God and what have you. But I have heard in the religious context of experiences that seem to be closer to, to what you're talking about, which is, you know, experiences of, of utter terror, of utter brokenness, of uh, utter defeat that, that, that can't be... The, that, that are impossible to put into language. They're impossible to talk to somebody about. Um, uh, they're both uh, felt physically, experienced of all five senses, uh, racked and electrified through the mind, but articulated into words that people can understand. Absolutely not. Is is having an experience like that brushing up against what you're talking about? Yeah, and we can say that what is called apophatic theology um, or apophatic thinking is something like that when. Uh, when you're not able to express in positive statement something uh, and you're only able to express it through negative statement but uh, the problem with theology or with those um, with those experiences that you are not able to mm, that you're not able to pass to other people is that it's still uh, it's still positive in a way that it supposes that the knowledge that you got or the transformation, something that you got is so um, so large, it's too much, 
it's still a present, but it's too muchness of presence. It's so much that it can't be transferred, this kind of knowledge, like sacred knowledge or something like that, cannot be transferred uh, too good to be uh, expressed. But so the trick that our mind plays with us is this, this which is basically just this void, the you disappear. And uh, to, to transfer it, to comprehend it even to yourself, you have to say that it's, so, it's still presence, it's not the absence. There is something there, just it's so much that you can't um, you can't express it, and you can't. And that's the problem, not the problem, but um, the something that characterizes the uh, apophatic thinking. It presupposes it possesses itself as um, this too muchness that cannot be expressed when it's actually just us, just the, <laughs> the opposite mechanism to what our thinking um, is working. Towards. Well, coming back to death, you, you mentioned in, in your work uh, the, the living dead. What does it mean to be the living dead? Uh, it's We can say that it means the same that uh, when, when we say that we are alive, mm -hmm. because <laughs> we tend not to notice that while we are alive, we are also dying. But more profoundly, uh, it's Catherine Malabu's, um, she uses this, uh, this term living dead to show the, those who went through traumatic experiences. So uh, we can say that in the moments, uh, in the moments of depression, and this would be sound in a position of depressive realism, we feel the most this inner essence of who we are, our nature as a uh, as something that is depressing in itself. We get in touch with ourselves when we traumatize, when we, we feel this non in non with um with the coherence of uh, of ourself. So we feel those ruptures, those voids when we depress, when we traumatize in negative states. Um and yeah and uh, so um and this is what uh, defines us from the perspective of uh, of depressive realism. So saying that we are living dead um, means that we are alive, but uh, it felt we feel the most like this. Uh, we always are living dead because we are uh, approaching our death. We are dying every moment. Uh, every second of our life, especially birthdays when they celebrate <laughs> we celebrate um, us approaching to our death. But we feel the most like that, you know. Um, Heidegger, for example, call, calls anxiety it's, um, when you leave uh, your death while you're alive. You become demotivated, uh, you, lo you, lo you lose um, meaning is lost for you. So you are dead inside, we can say. Uh, you are uh, feel like failure, something negative. So um, normally it would seen as a deviation of a normal state, and maybe it is deviation. Maybe uh, the illusionary and normal positive thinking, which is um, imposition of of illusion of positive bias, we can say that it's normal because it's easier to uh, to handle. But so living dead is uh, someone who is alive, but uh, we feel the most that we are approaching death, so that we are already dead, and we're never actually alive in those negative uh, negative moments of existence, which we prefer to group um, in a certain term as a deviation, just to um, take some distance from them and not to see them as, uh, not to see the painful truths that maybe it's, uh, who we actually are. Mm. Uh, what is ne uh, necropsychoanalysis or, or negative psychoanalysis? Uh, yeah, I was calling it necropsychoanalysis initially, but it scares people too much. <laughs> negative psychoanalysis is more neutral, but basically they're the same. It's the uh, psychoanalysis uh, that is opposite to to put it simply, the opposite to positive psychology or positive orientation of psychology, which is more or less all we now have, the conventional perspective, conventional worldview, our current intuition. Uh, and this is something different, uh, I hope. And it takes uh, negative negativity, it tries to, it attempts to take uh, neg negativity at the as the center uh, of it. And negativity is is sound, sound with death and void and 
all the absences and um, dying. So uh, negative psychoanalysis, I see myself, I see this kind of psychoanalysis as uh, accomplishes, accomplishes or fails to accomplish something that uh, Freud failed to accomplish even more. Uh, taken as a center, starting from uh, from his late concept. It's not actually his concept, but concept that he takes from Sabina Spielrein and uh, develops further concept of a death drive, uh, which is drive towards death, uh, which he comes to see as the central uh, drive of uh, psyche. And the problem was um, was Freud trying to include late Freud trying to include this concept into his framework of thinking is that his earlier work it just they don't fit together yeah. and he, it kind of exists uh, until now you know, even in in other types of psychoanalysis that take this concept even in Lacanian psychoanalysis it, it exists as something foreign to the general scope of uh, it uh, if you if you start with what Freud starts with individual as separate from other uh, from others as uh, someone who wants pleasure and happiness, you, you're you not able to include, it's very hard to include um, death drive into this perceptual of human. So I'm trying to start to make it, to put it at the center, actually see what will happen. And uh, for now, it works in self-comprehension, comprehension with of other people's better than... Uh, than Freud's initial intention. Right. And, you know, th there's going to be a lot of people listening and watching who aren't familiar with psychoanalysis. If, if they booked a, uh, a necro psychoanalysis session with you or a negative psychoanalysis session with you, what, what, would, what would actually happen in, in that hour? Is it free association or are you pointing out, uh, is it talk therapy? Are you pointing out where people are too happy or what, what, what's the actual process? Well, we do actually talk. <laughs> that might be a problem. Uh, but what I'm trying to to practice uh, with others is the dialogue of uh, comprehension through uh, through this negative perspective, but even more on more deeper level is maybe a practice of not actually uh, understanding of it's in somewhat similar to beyond uh, psychoanalyst beyond. Uh, uh, perspective uh, he was talking and his analytic method uh, was more about not understanding and the uh, apophatic we can say space of um, not understanding of uh, retaining capacity of non-knowledge and uh, not uh, understanding uh, so it might be the most uh, the most respectful position of to sustain when you don't comprehend well yourself and other person when you retain the space that what he called the negative uh, space negative uh, container when you and other person because there's the sh it can be a shared space when you are together at the same time uh, separate in the space when you don't understand in space of complexity in space of not getting knowledge or not aiming at salvation and not aiming at um, killing this the negative space and uh, f for him it was important to develop this uh, ability which is from perspective of positive psychology it's crazy and paradoxical because the reason people normally turn to psychologists and to analysts would be to to get something to get uh, to understand if not if not healing and salvation and improvement it would be at least uh, to get a uh, deeper understanding of who they are but um, not in the contrary not the non understanding and uh, for me is the most important thing and uh, which is which might be strange but uh, but still so it's trying to see um, the world and uh, others not from the positive perspective but from to sustain the negative perspective it's uh, not that it's not that it's impossible at the end uh, but at least 
try and fail <laughs> at the end, uh, because we still get some understanding, uh, something out of there. Or uh, people would normally um, say that they feel better. They need to say to for, for themselves that something good happened to give a value, to give a meaning. This, this is how mind works, but it is this process of a failure before we'll get something, before we'll get illusion that we're getting something. Um, for me, is the valuable uh, experience and negative to at least to some extent. Yeah. You know, my, my whole life, I've always wanted to be a, a productive depressive. So I, I don't know if I'm alone in that because in, in many ways, I'm, I'm fine with being depressed but but i'm not fine with it uh uh sort of uh sapping my vitality leaving me alone to to do anything uh uh leaving me uh, unable to do anything i i don't know if that's anything you ever encounter in your treatments or uh with clients with patients or or what have you or if there is if that's if that's asking for for too much if that if that stage should just be accepted as well i don't know if you have any thoughts on that why would you want to be productive when you're depressed? Isn't it? <laughs> yes. I I suspected that that's what you were going to say. <laughs> um, the mid-century produced many uh, existentialist and Heideggerian readings of, of ancient Gnosticism, emphasizing alienation, brokenness, and being trapped in a tragic existence. And, and in many ways, this has been left behind. Do, do you think a spiritual... And we talked about apophatic uh, theology, but do you think a spirituality or religion can have such themes or is it best to leave them behind and embrace them only in modes like uh, philosophy and psychoanalysis i think everything um everything gets in touch with the the tragic nature of existence but everything also has um its methods uh to escape it that's how uh this this is how it is able to to exist including religion including uh, psychology, including, well, uh, everything. It just, even everyday discussions and thinking as such, we kind of touch this uh, dimension, but at the same time, there are methods how to uh, mask it, how to, um, uh, how not to reveal it. Uh, and this is how we constitute the, the illusion of, of, of presence. Mm. If, uh, if sorrow is, is depression is sort of uh, constitutive to, to the human experience, like why, and I know this is a, a question that is very obvious and, and you've been touching on it just about every answer, but, but why do we run from it as humans and as a society if it's, if it's right there at, at all times? Well, it's questionable for me if you do uh, run away from, from it. And uh, maybe we don't, maybe just the alibi. And uh, it is uh, it is thought we do think of a definition as someone who uh, is aiming to be happy and to escape unhappiness. But the, um, for me, it's even question if we even want anything uh, at the core of who we are. And if you try to... Um, to use this kind of a perspective and try to reflect on yourself and other people through this perspective, it actually fits too, because we are so maybe complex and it's uh, impossible to understand ourselves to the end. Uh, that any, not any, but uh, a lot of perspective that contradict each other uh, would uh, it's possible to use them. Well, we, we do comprehend uh, ourselves sometimes from the perspective of horoscopes and it fits, you know, uh, maybe the same logic, uh, the same principle, why the perspective uh, that we want to be happy and avoid happiness also fits. So if you try to, uh, to notice that you actually want to disappear and you don't want to exist and that's the core, if you try out uh, this perspective, it will also work. And uh, so far, it's my favorite perspective, and <laughs> it works because almost everything else would work. Uh, but this one is is interesting how it's possible to uh, to live with it and to comprehend because it's so different radically to what we normally practice and what psychology 
um, uh, articulates what is the current normality. So it's the interesting way to be insane. Right. Okay. So we just have to pause uh, for a quick commercial. If you haven't thrown yourself out a window, uh, please donate at patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. And I might actually change that to a flat subscription because, you know, we touched on uh, repetitive compulsion just for a moment. And for whatever reason, I can't stop recording a lot of these shows looking at Gnosticism or what I call Gnosticism from a thousand different angles. So you can help me with this compulsion. We're hoping to put out quite a few more episodes episodes per week by donating whatever you can. Uh, you can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. You can also tell people about the show. You can share it. You can take an episode and send it to somebody. That's actually quite powerful. So, you know, copy the uh, the link to this episode, send it to somebody, um, and uh, I'm sure they will love it as much as you are loving it right now. Uh, also, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. If you listen to a podcast before, they all tell you to do that because the algorithms, the algorithms demand this of us. So, leave Leave us good reviews, hit us, smash that thumbs up button. You know what to do. You've used the internet before. Uh, Dr. Russia, you mentioned that that just about anything will work, right? Anyways, so is, and, and I put this in quotes, is, is there anything quote unquote wrong with just choosing the lobotomy, like be it literal or a chemical? Like if we find a way to be happy all the time, is it really just an illusion, even if it means like an ice pick to the frontal lobe? Like, you know, if, if you were, if you had a patient or client, you know, they've done a number, they've done years of sessions uh, with you in negative psychoanalysis. And then they say, you know, thanks Dr. Russia, I've gotten a lot out of this, but I'm just going to take the ice pick and get rid of the frontal lobe. Like, is it, what do you think about that? <laughs> I don't think, um, I'm not uh, saying that there is something right or wrong. And uh, maybe, uh, I hope I don't actually, maybe, <laughs> maybe I do. But the problem with, um, with our, with psychology, including with uh, psychologists and with, uh, uh, with human being, maybe as such, is that they assume that there is some, not right or wrong, but there are some people who know what to do, what is right or, or wrong. And now those people are uh, mostly psychologists. Like we think that they are authority, the current authority of what is right or wrong, what is healthy and unhealthy. And I just think that there are no such people who know. And if someone claims that they know, it's just because they scare themselves uh, to uh, to admit that there is no no one who actually knows, no one who actually can guide. So this maybe we do need uh, have a need for for messiahs for someone who uh, has expertise and know what to do with our who we are. But there are no such people, and there are no people who know. There are people who claim that they know and who we hope uh, know. But just uh, trying to accept the idea that nobody know. Even those who claim that they know, and those that we def think that definitely should have uh, authority or quality of of this kind of knowing. So, I'm trying to occupy a position maybe of more of not knowing, uh, not understanding, and uh, I think it's the negative position. But <laughs> still, I'm talking about something. So. Um, and I have certain direction of of thought, so maybe uh, uh, maybe I'm suggesting that something is right or wrong. When I'm trying to, what, the way I see uh, this pursuit of current pursuit of of uh, of current society, or maybe society uh, as long as it existed, as a, basically practicing uh, the lobotomy, what we can use the image of lobotomy to, to describe. So it's not like reducing who you are, not only part of your brain, but part of your existence because it's too much. You know, lobotomy was first practiced as a, as a treatment for depression, just get used of part of the brain um, and you feel better, which is true. You're not who you are, but um, you, uh, it's not the life, life is not so depressing anymore. But with, um, antidepressants they work in a similar a very similar way you just reduce to become more numb 
but also everything else except for it. If what we do, we distract ourselves with going to work. Like, how is it not <laughs> about TV? <you? laughs> you do something that you're supposed to have. You repeat a certain activity for no reason. Maybe you'll get money at the end. But how is this? Um, if you think deeper uh, about it, it doesn't compensate anything. Or you start a family or something like that. I mean, any any human activity can be seen as, as lobotomy. You just reduce, you try to find uh, what to do with your life or what to, uh, to uh, according to perspective of depressive realism is, uh, well, some of the representatives of depressive realism that any human activity can be seen as this escape of, of uh, depressing state of, uh, uh, that is at the core of of our existence. So any whatever we do uh, can be seen as something similar to um, to lobotomy. And it, it's saying that it's wrong. Just stop doing it. Be who you actually are. Stop ex escaping from. It. I think person would just it's person would disappear. They it won't the it won't be possible to articulate language. Even language as such can be seen as you reaching out to someone you're trying to um, you're trying to put in words this undefined indefinite space within you or if, even if there is any you and who you are trying to articulate it make it um, possible for other people to understand it or pursue or have the illusion that it's possible to understand or transmit it somehow so any human activity can be seen as a lobotomy and saying that it's wrong that we have to do something else it's still going to be a reduction of saying what to do and saying that something's wrong that which means there is something right but there is no right uh, that's that's the problem and there is no one who knows what to do what is uh, right or wrong right is it is it like more terrifying to to realize not that that you the individual doesn't know something, but that there's nobody out there that that knows something that has the answer? Because I think a lot of us have come to the conclusion that that we don't know. Yeah, but uh, it is terrifying. I think <laughs> everything is terrifying if you think deep enough about it. Normally, uh, philosophy would be the next stage in comparison with maybe. Uh, contemporary uh, psychology uh, to see to in uh, in search for someone who knows better or who provides some more complicated uh, type of of knowledge but it also functions as a just different uh, in my view it can be seen as something that functions as a different way of escaping uh, not knowing or not knowing or looking for authorities actually uh, know, but they don't <laughs> know. <laughs> they mix, but in a more fancy way, like anyone else. Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, we have, and I think people sometimes uh, are, have already noticed uh, me struggling with language and how easy it is to fall into. Uh, dualistic language around right and wrong, positive, negative, good and bad. But but I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the death drive. In that, is it simply the 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 biological march towards what we think of as literal death? Because I've also heard of it. And again, excuse the limitations of language. Describe sort of more positively, as in the death drive has this this force, this energy that can, for instance, break us out of us. Uh, uh, bring about social death that that could be positive right it can bring about revolution which is which is a kind of death of the order is 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 death drive sort of broader like this does it have these deeper implications or is it simply the the march to the grave well maybe it's both uh, so for for freud and this is the problem with initial framework of freud thinking uh, he concentrated on individual psyche uh, separated from it's a psyche of uh, male human being also uh, maybe that may be a little bit a problem and um, and it's also initially psyche that is the individual psyche separated uh, kind of from others and aimed at pleasure it's very hard to include death drive in this this larger general framework if Freud would generally uh, genuinely accept the concept of the death drive, the whole framework uh, of uh, 
theory of psychoanalysis would uh, collapse and the whole idea of what psychoanalysis does as a practice would collapse too. And maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's not the wrong thing. But um, so it is, um, they are different. The, um, the, this kind of, uh, the death drive, the way he, the way he, he was trying to uh, include it into his scope of thinking, preserving the idea of a pleasure principle, the search for of pleasure of individual psyche. Uh, his concept of a death race, which is more a parody because it is reduced to individual death, uh, it's re reduced to biological death, and uh, it coexists somehow with, doesn't contradict radically the pleasure principle. He manages to preserve the pressure principle, which is impossible, I think, to preserve if you genuinely accept the idea of a, of a death ref. So we can say, um, I would say that it's, and Todd McGovern is uh, one of the contemporary thinkers, actually the only one who tries to, except for me, uh, who tries to see death drive as something uh, not only uh, something that is not only about individual psyche, but also about society. Mm -hmm. uh, drive towards this, but there are so many limitations with uh, with the death drive. Even though it's my favorite concept in psychoanalysis and maybe in general in life, but uh, first of all, the drive part—it's still a drive. It's still aim at something, and and in Sabina Spielrein, uh, she would tend to call it instinct, and I would tend to call it um, calling or call. It's not within you. It's not something that you want because if you if you die, then you're successful in accomplishing. You still get some kind of success, success, and it still drives you. It still motivates you in a weird way, but it's still an um, active force. And I would say that it's something outside of of self. That was this is more close to Sabina Spielrein's uh, perspective. It's outside of your self, and self is illusionary in comparison it's in comparison to the other uh, dimension or layer, uh, which she calls Sabina Spielrein is called we psyche. So, and uh, the, this calling of death is uh, is uh, calling of uh, of individual psyche to disappear, or illusion of existence of individual psyche to uh, disappear. So. Uh, but also the problem um, that biological death uh, or death the way we perceive it is that the, uh, we disappear as individual being, our body is something, well, it's still there, but it's uh, inactive. So we can say this something like a soul disappears from body, it's still there, but it's not moving. <laughs> it's, um, so it's... Um, there are lots of limitation with this perception of of death and how it happens and how it's limited to uh, individual. Even in this larger scope perspective that includes sociality as by death drive or in Sabina Spielrein's um, idea of a death drive as something that dissolves uh, the more profound level of we togetherness uh, where self doesn't exist and there is this inner calling for individual self to disappear in it and that would be death but um death of individual self but the problem with this kind of death uh, in Sabina Spielrein's comprehension that uh, you can still see it as within the logic of death as of individual that something that aimed uh, to reproduction preservation or um becoming of a larger scale, we can say organism or of humanity, for example, or species of humans, which is also not true. That's Schopenhauer motive here as seeing individual uh, as uh, not uh, important, but there is some, some other larger scale uh, entity, uh, like uh, mm, Plato's ideas, for example, which for him biological, uh, in biological dimension for Schopenhauer uh, would be a species of human being. There is the one has to be sacrificed separate, separate individual has to be sacrificed, especially women 
uh, during childbirth and all this stuff. They have to be sacrificed as in for to preserve this species, those idea of a human. But this is not true in evolution. It's in the same way, in a similar way, as um, individual, the species would also uh, extinct. It's not. It's not eternal. It's also it's just different layers. So if we can say death. Uh, if it's possible to get rid to this individualized biological comprehension of this, it's much. It's like on at, um, the only thing that is happening, the destruction, um, and it's not aimed at larger scale positive thing like generation. Just it's all that there is on many layers. It's happening, and nothing else is happening. And it's there is no aim of generation of something larger than what dies. It just all the whole thing of all the layers, <laughs> different forms, it just disappearing. Um, and uh, it might sound weird, but it, there's nothing that exists in the first place because it exists. It's not that there is something and then it disappears uh, and something else appears. There is nothing, it disappears and nothing else appears. Like it's this negative um, thing going on. Uh, on all the levels and this way of thinking is very hard to to fit um, into anything because thinking that tend naturally to see uh, positive processes as leading or as something leading to something or starting from the present of something it's hard to think negativity and death um, well even death is thought as negative in christianity it's uh, in, even in kierkegaard it's the step towards the real life so that's has is problematic it's part of this problematic positive thinking which is can only be positive <laughs> so not to be repetitive but but as we start to wrap up i kind of want to go back to the beginning which is you know talk about you personally your work personally do you feel that that like the aeon editors that people still try to wring happiness and joy from your work like a reading such as if i accept this tragedy of human existence and i'll have freedom i can move on with my life i could be productive i can actually be whole and complete and, and you know that that's more of a personal question of, of trends that you may have noticed coming from the outside of people looking at your work, embracing your work, sharing your work, interpreting your work? Yeah, they do, of course. Otherwise, it just um, it won't work. For something to work, you have to add the illusion of positivity, but uh, that it transforms you or, you know, through suffering, you become a better person through suffering, acceptance of, uh, of depression or whatever. Uh, you become my favorite one is uh, more understanding. That's my personal positive bias. Like I can, I'm holding on to it. Once I, uh, I'm not able anymore. I will uh, just stop <laughs> everything. But um, it should be. That's how we work. That's how we communicate. We communicate through uh, how we survive. Maybe even. Even if you understand, luckily, even if you understand that this is a bias, it's not true, it still works. <laughs> so maybe that's the best we can do. Um, understanding that that's not true, but it still works, even if it's, um, it's like a horoscope. Once you read it, you understand that it's complete, um, uh, idi it's idiotic to, to, to believe in it, but you still have it at the back of your mind. They still work, even if they don't work. So maybe it was the rest of the thinking. It's positivity works um, in a similar way. Right. So uh, final question, Dr. Resha, tell us about your upcoming book. My upcoming book, uh, I think it's going to be published in around the year just submitted the manuscript and it's on negative psychoanalysis, which I see as um, alternative to positively oriented uh, psychology and positively oriented uh, psychoanalysis too. It combines uh, psychoanalysis with a perspective of depressive realism and existential pessimism. And it tries to, it attempts to start, to start with the concept of a death drive as central it relies on various contemporary uh, thinkers and develop in dialogue with them, trying to make them more negative than they are. And those people who uh, now actively work with the concept of a death drive and trying to appropriate it to their conceptions, 
uh, like Catherine Malabu with her destructive plasticity, um, Todd McGowan with his social uh, death drive, and Alenka Zupancic with her comprehension of, of nature and of death drive. Um, so I'm trying to make psychoanalysis turn it into negative and suggest some possibility of negative practice. But again, the book is a failure because it's impossible to write a book about uh, uh, generally accepting. Uh, you can't, we cannot offer negative because negative is not the thing to offer. So it's my, uh, in a similar way, Freud failed, and whoever else touched the concept of destructive plasticity, they would actually fail to include it in their thinking as magical concept that ruins everything, including human lives. Um, so it's a, my failure, my personal failure, failure, um, failing attempt to make uh, to start with the. Uh, to put the, the concept of a death drive into the center of psychoanalysis. Amazing. So uh, thanks again so much for joining us. And people can find you at your homepage, which is simply your name, julieresha.com. And uh, we mentioned the Aeon essay a few times, which was very popular. I'm throwing the, the long URL up on the screen for people at home who are watching. But don't worry if listening to this as a podcast or you don't want to write this down. I'm going to put the entire link as well as Dr. Resha's other links in the show notes. So go down there, check her out online and uh, embrace the negativity. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Resha. Very well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.